good evening everyone welcome to today's seminar and i it's my proud privilege to be here uh, i am i consider myself fortunate that i'm here in three capacities today one is as the secretary of the indian association of private psychiatry uh, as a treasurer of alzheimer's related disorders society of india mumbai chapter and as a president of bombay psychiatric society because all these three associations are partnering together for this event on world alzheimer's day uh it's also now an honor for me to uh first of course be thankful to all the ec members of bombay psychiatric society and indian association of private psychiatry who have been here today and of course uh, uh mrs uh, vidya shanoi who's the current president of the alzheimer's related disorders society of india mumbai branch with whom i think i have been through the day doing multiple programs and of course dr mithal has also been part of some of them but now uh, it's more than that i'm very happy that i get to introduce our two chairpersons for today uh, the first chairperson is professor dr anukan mittal who needs no introduction in bombay circles uh, sir is professor and head of the department of psychiatry at the rajiv gandhi medical college kalwa thane a very seasoned examiner seasoned teacher most sought after speaker but most importantly sir is the national president of the indian association of private psychiatry and that's why sir is here with us today uh, we have with us dr mahesh gowda who is a consultant psychiatrist from bangalore and is the head of the spandana institute of rehabilitation in bangalore and uh, uh, he is the honorary editor of the indian uh, uh, association of private psychiatry where we run a journal called the indian journal of private psychiatry so students residents listening in please send us papers the journal is in the process of indexing which will happen very soon so i mean any and even private practitioners who are listening in who would like to send papers please send us papers because we are receptive to all sorts of papers more from a private setup again because it's a private psychiatry journal uh, so welcome to uh, dr mithal and uh, um, mahesh and i'll hand over now to you all yeah Yeah. I'll hand over to you also for taking this further. So you're mute. Right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Priyanka. Um. Yeah. Um. Uh, welcome all of you. Uh. It is nice to see. I'm sure all of you have been through the gamut of webinars today. at least i have been and i have been on the other side so i'm sure many of you have been tired of listening to various parts but yes dementia is going to be very important and i believe that about 30 to 40% of the patient that you see in the next 20 years in your practice are going to be patients showing some signs of dementia or geriatric uh, issues uh today becomes uh an important aspect of our coming together because for long we have tried to bring all the stakeholders uh on one platform uh and as you know i i have always been quoted as saying that 75 to 80% of uh psychiatric or mental health care delivery in india is through private psychiatrists and if we take that as a reality then uh, we are going to be facing all these in our private practices so uh this uh brings us to the point about what has changed since i was a student 30 years ago and dementia was first uh, diagnosed okay. clinically and management protocols were established so what has changed since then and what are the more important critical issues now facing us uh we will deliberate on this i would like uh, dr mahesh gowda my colleague from uh, bangalore to take over and uh, introduce the speakers and go on with that dr. thank you mahesh. dr mithil uh, thank you dr avinash uh, that's a very wonderful introduction i think uh, it's very important that we discuss on uh, very relevant and critical issues in the management of dementia rightly so this program is designed on this very important day of 21st september and today we have the first speaker dr ravi soni 
Dr. Ravi Soni uh, is the first geriatric uh, psychiatrist in uh, Gujarat, and he's done his DM from KGMC Lucknow. Uh, he is uh, very popular, and he's done a lot of programs. I see a lot of uh, invites on uh, public awareness program that he's doing. He's been the invited faculty and speaker in many conferences. His keen interests are awareness programs, and he is uh, quite keen on looking at all the concerns of mental health, whether it's psychological, whether it's uh, organic, and whether it's uh, psychotherapeutic intervention versus the pharmacological intervention. His keen interest has always been geriatric psychiatry, and that was his calling. And he's done numerous workshops. He's had numerous publications also in the national and international level. Today, we have with us Dr. Ravi Soni, who is going to talk on very important aspects of uh, uh, suicide in dementia and uh, it's a very relevant thing simply because a lot of valuable lives are lost for no apparent reasons and we've celebrated the um, you know uh, suicide prevention day also and uh, today we are going to talk on both the issues that are relevant suicide and dementia over to dr ravi soni thank you sir thank you my sir a very good good evening to everyone so today i'll be talking about suicide and dementia so without wasting much time because we are already running 10 minutes late so i'll just uh, start sharing slides so is it visible yep we can okay. see your slide okay is it still visible yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll start my uh, presentation. So today is World Alzheimer's Day and I'm, I really feel privileged that I'm talking about suicide and dementia on this day. Uh, in my talk, I, I will be very brief about suicide and dementia worldwide. Uh, there will be no specific uh, 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 sections over suicide and uh, Alzheimer's disease, suicide in FTD, suicide in LBD, but uh, it will come uh, on the uh, later on sites, suicide and dementia Indian context. There are no head to head studies available in Indian context. I have gone through everything, but I have not found any studies related to suicide and dementia, though there is a uh, morbidity mortality related studies, but they are not uh, very specific. And uh, lastly, I'll share some uh, clinical experience about uh, depression suicide in dementia. So uh, 5 to 10 percent of uh, patients with very mild to severe dementia are reported to feel their life not worth living on Hamilton depression rating scale. So uh, number of the patient with explicit death wishes or thoughts of suicide was markedly smaller. Certain uh, researchers have described that death wishes which were, uh, were present in 3 percent of the patients and suicidal ideation or gestures even less than one person and certain studies have found that there is no uh, uh, association or there are no verbatims like wishes to be dead or having actual suicide ideation or gestures so later on uh, we'll see that there is a presence of association or there is absence of association so it will come later on the actual risk of suicide attempts in dementia is considered to be low and not to exceed that of the age met general population. Uh, certain uh, Israeli studies have found that it is 7.44% and in Chinese study 12% of the admissions in geriatric psychiatry unit of the dementia patient were related to suicide attempts and ideation. Significantly higher prevalence of suicide ideation and plans or attempts were present in patients with frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So I'll go through certain very important studies and the uh, two studies are recently published in July, June and July 2021. So this is a uh, original research and published in 27 July 2021 suicide ideation behavior in patient with young and low, late onset dementia. So uh, the uh, dementia facts of suicide and dementia were similar to those earlier slides but what are the risk factors? This is very important to identify the high risk patient, high risk dementia patient. So majority of the studies have found that significant psychiatric comorbidities like depression, anxiety, delusions and comorbid substance use are present and uh, is a significant risk factor. Apart from this, recent diagnosis of dementia 
मेल सेक्स सिम्टम ऑनसेट और डायग्नोसिस बिफोर द एज ऑफ सिक्सटी फाइव ईयर्स सो यंगर यंगर द एज अर्ली स्टेज ऑफ डिमेंशिया वेन देर इज अ रिटेंशन ऑफ इन साइट देर इज कॉग्निशन इज बेटर एट दैट टाइम दे कैन प्लान एंड एग्जीक्यूट सुसाइड अटैम्प्ट एंड आइडिएशन कैन बी एग्जीक्यूटेड प्रॉपरली इन अर्ली स्टेजिज ऑफ डिमेंशिया हिस्ट्री ऑफ प्रीवियस साइकियाट्रिक हॉस्पिटलाइजेशन एंड प्रिस्क्रिप्शन रिफिल्स ऑफ एंटी डिप्रेशन एंड एंगजोलाइटिक्स दिस ऑल आर फाउंड टू बी हैविंग सम ऑफ दी दिज आर दी रिस्क फैक्टर्स फॉर सुसाइड इन डिमेंशिया पेशेंट्स Uh, I have gone through so many research, but there are only uh, some studies uh, have shown that what are the methods of suicide. So this is a one uh, very large scale retrospective European study which shows that self poisoning, twenty eight percent was the most common method of suicide in European study, and mostly these uh, uh, poisoning uh, drugs or uh, substances are paracetamol, opium, analgesics, and all uh, so on. Drowning. as a method was present in 90% of the patient hanging 17 jumping 8% suffocation 6% and cutting and stabbing uh, 5% so these are the methods of suicide so there is another systematic review that that was published in june 2018 that complex relationship between suicide dementia and amyloid that is a narrative review so we will go through certain detail of this uh, uh, review because it is very important uh, there is association between completed suicide and dementia but majority of the studies have shown conflicting results and why it is happening why it has happened because certain studies have relatively small clinical symptoms because this is a narrative review they have taken so many studies together similar to systematic review there are lack of standardized tool in certain studies lack of stratification according to the disease stage like mild moderate and severe stage sometimes even dementia types were not uh, noted or specified so there are so many conflicting results and because of that only there are certain studies that has found association between completed suicide and dementia while there are studies which shows there is no association in suicide rates in uh, older population in community and those older population with dementia so those studies who shows presence of association will go through certain details the patient with dementia have 3 to 10 fold higher risk to die by suicide patient with huntington disease are at highest risk with rate of completed suicide is about 13% suicide risk is high among alzheimer's disease patient as compared to vascular and particularly in women while presence of alzheimer's pathology is more frequent in people older than 60 years who commit suicide but the patient still have not developed any uh, uh, clinical symptoms of alzheimer's disease modified breath that is histopathological scoring of alzheimer's that reflects the neurofibrillary tangle numbers was higher in suicide victims than in control and in the early stages of alzheimer's disease risk of the suicide is highest increase there is the study has found that increased risk of completed suicide is present in first 6 month after the diagnosis of dementia and why this is happening so there are certain reasons because the patient is about aware about the cognitive decline and they start feeling of burden somewhere towards the significant others stress is induced by the anti anticipation of autonomy loss and the feeling of impairment in daily life functioning increase prevalence of comorbid and depressive symptom as as well as adjustment disorders presence of other comorbidities like substance use bipolar disorder and anxiety disorder presence of good cognition can allow planning execution of com- completed suicide deficits in executive functioning certain decision making issues and inhibition process this will uh, pro- uh, this, there will be a lack of inhibition to commit Uh, uh not to commit suicide so these people will be more impulsive and there are certain studies in which there is lack uh, lack of association so there is no certain studies have shown that there is no additional risk of completed suicide in people with dementia some studies shows that there is not a single death by completed suicide in dementia sample histopathological examinations between community samples and those who commit suicide Uh, those who die by suicide about the age of 65 years age there is no uh, correlation 
American Psychiatry Association says that elderly person in general and elderly men in particular are at increased risk of suicide although the diagnosis of dementia is not known to confirm added risk so it, they also says that the presence of dementia does not increase the uh, risk of suicide severe cognitive impairment in the later stage of dementia could protect against completed suicide by reducing the capacity to accomplish a suicidal plan so there is association with uh, between dementia and suicidal attempts and ideation that will be noted here as sa and si in dementia suicidal attempt is lower than 1% and in some studies completely absent suicidal attempts are more common in patient with dementia and psychiatric comorbidities risk of suicide behavior decreases when cognitive impairment increases so mostly all the study says the same suicidal ideation is very rare 10% of alzheimer's disease patient reported hopelessness but no suicidal ideation in one study lifetime suicidal ideas are not more frequent in patients with dementia than in age matched non demented control so there is no significant difference suicidal ideations and feeling of worthlessness are correlated with the severity of cognitive decline measured by mmsc this is reported in one study so in chinese study the prevalence of suicidal ideation and attempts in a dementia uh, patient is ranging from 2 to 2.2 to 16 percent even higher so there is another study a very important study which shows there is high risk of suicide in behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia so according to this uh, scale to suicidal uh, stress induced uh, impulsive scale 40% of uh, patient with behavioral variant showed suicide ideation in comparison to 8% of the control so behavioral variant of the uh, frontotemporal dementia as we all know that uh, there is a uh, more impulsivity there are three kind of presentation uh, those who have complete personality change behavioral uh, access so there will be disinhibition impulsivity and there are people who are apathetic depressed and withdrawn so there is a behavioral deficit so there are different kind of uh, uh, suicidal uh, risk in both the part but notably the patient with behavioral variant of ftd with extra pyramidal signs at higher level of suicide ideation and also they have shown that a uh, uh, risk of suicide is high, uh, high in those patient with more hopelessness depression anxiety and stress there is another study by levy body dementia association working group in america that so they have uh, conducted a review between suicide and levy body dementia which shows that uh, there are uh, 3.1 percent of the patient who had suicidal plan and attempt less than 0.1 percent but the occurrence of non-accidental self-injury it's much higher in dlb patient as compared to alzheimer's disease so here is a uh, image from the same uh, study uh, which shows the which are the factors that are more important here so disease characteristic if depression is present anxiety is present because dlb patient has more hallucination delusions it gives more weight uh, in uh, uh, suicidal risk factors higher overall non motor symptom burden motor fluctuation is also suicide risk uh, higher perceived disability other uh, uh, patient consideration the past history of self harm prior suicide attempt fewer or milder associated comorbidities high demoralization and earlier di in diagnostic period so these are certain studies which shows that there is a clear cut association but uh, overall suicide and dementia there is a conflicting results inconsistent results in uh, majority of the studies there are studies who shows that there is a, a association and there are studies who show that there is no association between suicide and dementia is uh, only the presence of dementia in elderly doesn't increase the suicidal risk as for my clinical experience for last 4 to 5 years i have not seen a single case of death by completed suicide in dementia patient in uh, whatever area i have worked there are reports of wish to die uh, in, but no active suicidal ideation no suicidal attempt caregivers upon asking mostly say that patient shows wish to die at least 3 to 4 times a month month even in the absence of depression but when the depression is present i have seen that this verbal behavior increases to 3 to 4 times a week 
but as all the studies have confirmed that in the early stage of dementia when the cognition is better at that time this depressive affect and uh, uh, suicidal ideation and uh, all of these are more verbal but they usually do not attempt maybe it is a cultural variation in our country the elderly uh, do not do that but uh, i have not seen even a single death of a uh, dementia patient by committing suicide so this is all from my side thanks thanks for uh, listening thanks for your patience thank you thank you thank you dr ravi you want to feel uh, for question answers now dr priyanka you are going to help us with that who is helping us with that so do you want to take the questions in the last yeah yeah no avinash dr avinash said that we should take the questions immediately after the speaker finishes uh, so any questions are there on the box uh not yet so we don't have any questions in the chat box yet so anyone who has queries post them in the uh, chat can chat box or raise the hand or something we can see uh, yeah any hands raised a very good presentation dr soni a uh, very good statistics and i am i'm quite sure i'm, I'm surprised uh, that you've not encountered uh, completed uh, uh, deaths you have not seen deaths by self harm uh, i don't know but in my practice i have seen many patients who have managed to uh, you know uh, injure themselves and uh, not succeeded as well as succeeded in uh, completing that many of them have been depressed before some of them have had never expressed any ideas of hopeless helpless or what is um but it has never been an impulsive act it has been a slow deterioration of the mood uh i don't know what my co-chair dr mahesh's experience has been so as dr ravi was saying we don't commonly you know encounter completed suicide probably the issues could be under reporting they actually don't come back uh, with this sort of data uh, the right. family may may not be feeling it relevant to uh, report a completed death to us unless the hospital has captured some statistics sir. so i i really don't know whether uh, we don't have completed suicides or is it just the issue with the uh, reporting sir no my my one one experience one of the family relatives had told me very clearly he said if we report it as suicide we don't get life insurance claim uh which which we may laugh at uh currently but yes uh it is one of the exclusion clauses in the life insurance claims uh and uh, many people who have lifelong insurances uh would not you know they don't mind and social uh uh stigma also is there in addition but more important than that is the financial because that large amount of money which would have come doesn't come because uh you declared it as suicide uh self harm so that is an exclusion clause in the lic policy and other policies that is probably the reason why it does yes okay. yes sir. that can be the reason and sir i just want to share another uh, uh, clinical experience that majority of the uh, times what i have seen in the behavioral uh, uh, disorders of the dementia patient that they are more kind of physically aggressive towards relative so self harm i have seen but it is less but more uh, physical aggression towards relatives and caretakers and attendants that is that is if they have vpsd they yes yes sir vpsd yes sir and then the uh i don't know anyway uh any any questions further or we can move on to the next speaker uh yeah there are no okay. questions in chat box sir no none so we can move on to the next speaker then right so thank you thank you sony very much uh, thank you sir excellent talk and excellent data you thank you very much for being with us uh specially uh so we have the next speaker uh mahesh would you like to yes yes i shall introduce uh i would like to welcome the next speaker for today's presentation dr nishant goel
he is a professor of psychiatry at cip ranchi he is also the in charge of child and adolescent services he is also in charge of academics he is the president elect for jharkhand psychiatric society he is the honorary editor for the eastern journal of psychiatry he is also among the editorial board across numerous journals his keen interests have been neuromodulation child and adolescent psychiatry non invasive brain stimulation public mental health he has 80 plus publications he's been a part of organizing committee of ancips that happened at ranchi and uh, a lot of people know him as a very dear friend and uh, he's quite uh, keen to teach students welcome to dr nish uh, dr nishant goel and today he's going to talk on uh, epilepsy and uh, dementia uh, cip ranchi has a huge number of uh, epilepsy cases we do remember dr hak uh, actually having a largest collection of uh, uh, you know epilepsy cases there so i think it's a huge experience that cip ranchi has and uh, rightly so nishant is there to talk on epilepsy and dementia over to dr nishant uh, thank you mahesh i i'm sure you are able to hear me yes sir yeah yeah so <clears throat> it's pretty uh, you know weird that a person who has keen interest in child psychiatry is uh, you know invited to uh, speak on world alzheimer's day but yes uh, as mahesh uh, said that uh, i am fortunate to you know take over Uh, the very it's a very old epilepsy clinic at cip ranchi i guess it's the only place uh, a psychiatric hospital in the country where uh, we have a weekly uh, epilepsy clinic and uh, we have a whole range of uh, you know investigation and assessment for patients of epilepsy so uh, i'll try to uh, speak on the topic which is given to me uh, so just allow me to share my screen yeah uh, sir can you can you please confirm if you can see the slides absolutely we can clearly thank you sir so uh, without wasting much of time uh, today i have been asked to speak on dementia and epilepsy what a psychiatrist needs to know so <clears throat> before uh, moving on to my presentation i would like to thank uh, you know iapp uh, bombay psychiatric society particularly dr avinash souza uh, what dementia is as we all know it means uh, if you literally uh, mean it it's the mens like right? without mind so it's progressive irreversible syndrome of impaired memory intellectual functioning personality and behavior causing significant impairment in functioning i'll not go into the details of types of dementia we all know what are the various types of dementia we frequently encounter in our clinical or day to day practice interestingly uh, as uh, dr mittal also pointed out in his opening remarks that few years down the line around 20 to 30% of the cases uh, which we are going to see in our clinical practice would be patients from of dementia and it came in the lancet commission report in july 2017 and uh, they basically also talked about the fact that uh, one in three cases of dementia can be prevented by significantly addressing the lifestyle factors now uh, i'll present my uh, you know presentation uh, i'll start my presentation with a case of a 76 year old man who had a stroke at the age of 74 years who developed a generalized tonic clonic seizure 3 months later he was started on phenytoin another had a break he had another breakthrough seizures where phenytoin was increased to 400 mg <clears throat> so uh, i'm sure all of you or all of us they we do come across uh, patients uh, in the elderly age group who present to us with epilepsy now the most common causes of uh, you know epilepsy in elderly are seen on the right side of your screen most commonly it is because of ischemic stroke which is again the most common cause of stroke in this age group in this particular population followed by you know tumors alzheimer's disease etc 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 so uh, if we see the causes of epilepsy in the age group suppose uh, if i say that uh, from 45 to 64 years uh, see i am not talking purely about dementia and epilepsy dementia is a part of you know major part of illness when it comes to elderly so around uh, see around uh, 50% of the cases of uh, up to 64 years are because of cere cerebral vascular accident with a large proportion of them having epilepsy because of the brain tumor but after the age of 65 years the age where most of the people or most of the dementia is seen the most common cause 
of epilepsy is a cerebrovascular accident or various episodes of cerebrovascular accident now types of seizures if you ask what are the various types of seizure contrary to the general understanding the most common type of seizures in patients more than 60 years of age are complex partial seizures followed by generalized tonic clonic seizures and very few of them they have simple partial seizures or you know secondary generalization or mixed type of seizures now the challenge the biggest challenge in epilepsy in elderly or epilepsy in dementia for that matter is there are few things one is because most of the elderly patients they suffer from multiple medical problems so at times the diagnosis of epilepsy remains maybe it is remain undiagnosed or it is obscured by the other problems the symptoms are usually atypical uh, which are not commonly seen in you know other age groups and many people they think that it is because of aging or depression as it was discussed in the by the previous speaker secondly or i think it, for me it is the most important thing at elderly people many a times they live alone there is no one to observe them there is lot of delays like patient they are not able to seek help because of we don't have a very good social you know security system where you know like these people are seen on a regular basis it's the study say that after the first seizure less than 50% of the cases of elderly with epilepsy are diagnosed and only 7 less than 70% of they are ultimately diagnosed by primary care physicians now there is a gamut of problems which is associated with older people with epilepsy you can see uh, this whole screen is filled up with problems problems related to cognitive impairment people developing dementias social support relationships pharmacological comorbidities psychiatric comorbidities systemic problems which can like everyone has hypertension dyslipidemia autoimmune diseases they they develop behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia so so many things are happening in this particular age group now coming to the topic per se when we are talking about dementia and epilepsy uh, i found out this literature which said that the maximum number of publications when it comes to you know dementia in and epilepsy are seen with alzheimer's disease alzheimer's disease with dementia has the maximum number of publications followed by vascular dementia and de dementia of lewy bodies followed by other types of dementia i'll come to them one by one now coming to epilepsy in alzheimer's disease studies say that epileptic seizures are more common in patients with alzheimer's disease than in age match control uh, these are few studies i'll not go into the details of this it ranges from around 8% to 10% or 16% they say what makes alzheimer's dementia patients to have seizures the most consistent finding in studies say it's the bilateral temporal atrophy or in other words mesial temporal lobe sclerosis there are certain mechanisms which have been defined for causing causation of seizures in alzheimer's disease the most commonly uh, talked about is a tau we all know tau proteins i am not going to the details of amyloid tau protein beta lipoprotein so tau induced increase in the presynaptic glutamate it is the most commonly uh, you know talked about mechanism along with that uh, there are problems with post synaptic ampa and mda receptors alteration in the voltage gated ion channels in the brain cholinergic increase in the cholinergic tones and there are so many other factors i am not going to the details of that because uh, right today i am focusing more on the you know the, the clinical aspects of it now uh, talking about vascular dementia as i said that most of uh, the causes of dementia like you know the ischemic uh, stroke is the most common cause of causing causation of epilepsy in this particular age group so in binswanger disease particularly uh, or in sorry i'll go just yeah I just uh, i skipped few slides i'm sorry about that yeah so uh, what we what do we know about epilepsy in vascular dementia studies say that 6% of the stroke patients develop seizure within one week of the infarction and another 3% by one year and vascular dementia patients 
are more likely to have partial onset seizures whereas alzheimer's dementia patients are more likely to have generalized onset seizures and the odds ratio of people uh, of you know vascular dementia developing epilepsy is as good as 8% so these are few statistics which i thought that we should all need to know i'll tell you why when i am going to end my presentation so as i as i have told about you know vascular dementia or binswanger's dementia uh, there is a condition there is the pathology which is called lipohyalinosis in the small vessels uh, which basically makes the person prone to develop seizure followed by lewy body dementia or dlb as we all know uh, i i'm sure you we all know what is dlb it is dementia along with either parkinsonism or altered consciousness or altered alertness and visual hallucinations uh, classical lewy body present in these cases so uh, uh, interestingly not many cases are there which are reported where there is clear cut epilepsy in dlb cases uh, i'm just reporting one case where a person had repeated hallucinations basically which was confused with symptoms of dlb versus seizure but it was when eeg was done and it was found that uh, it was basically coming out of you know uh, the seizure and when the person was treated with zonisamide 200 mg per day the person showed significant improvement finally uh, talking about uh, something called tau pathies and uh, we know what are the various tau pathies or uh, you know dementia caused by tau protein uh, so these are frontotemporal dementias ppas psps and cbds now interestingly on the right side of your screen if you see a person uh, starting from you know cognitive being cognitively normal gradually developing mild cognitive impairment and finally alzheimer's disease now the time when there is starting of mild cognitive impairment after a person started to develop you know beta amyloid uh, you know deposition in the brain there is increase in the or increased activation of the hippocampus this is the time where there is increased epileptic activity or abnormal electrical activity in the brain and finally when tau proteins are deposited in the brain it causes the maximum chances of a person to develop seizures or epileptic activity now first talking about uh, ftd we, we all know what is ftd it is marked by dementia with disinhibited behaviors restlessness motor apraxia uh, P, progressive supranuclear palsy uh, it presents with a one it's it's a very unique sign it's called the hummingbird sign on mri you can see uh, you know on the right side of your screen where you know the mid brain looks like a hummingbird and we uh, psp presents with pals dysarthria apathy bradykinesia gaze palsy and seizures then cbd i am not going to the details of what cbd is uh, now uh, there are very less studies particularly in human beings but uh, there is a mouse model for epilepsy in tau pathy which says that there is increased gaba receptor mediated hyperexcitability in these cases which is not because of the uh, beta amyloid protein it is because of the tau protein now uh, coming to some of the important clinical features because we uh, are more concerned about the clinical aspect of patients who come to us with epilepsy as i said auras are less common if they are present it most the most common aura is being dizziness there are not much automatisms and there is a prolonged period of post ictal confusion because the cerebral reserve is less in such cases common initial presentations they include altered mental state syncope blackout falls memory impairment etc etc people they also present with new onset sleep walking or sleep talking vivid dream with arousals and jerking in sleep so all these things should be routinely asked if a person you are you are, you are suspecting to have uh, you know epilepsy while the person is suffering from dementia 
the diagnosis is done usually by the detailed history uh, circumstances of the event should be assessed very very vividly it is extremely important and i, I know it's very difficult because at times many of the many of the old people they live alone or they live with caregivers or caretakers so so it has to be you know understood very importantly we have to take detailed past medical neurological and psychiatric history as well as history of medications i'll tell you why again physical examination look we should look for lateralizing neurological signs and we should do a good cognitive function examination we should try at least hmsc or mm mmsc the i am sure we all do but at least hmsc or uh, these days people do moca or uh, i would say strabin black examination is like if it is possible for us we should all go for it and we should go for certain investigations we all know now interesting part of epilepsy in dementia is that routine eeg which lasts for say 20 minutes gives a very less yield this has been found in consistently in studies and they have proposed that we should go for a long term video eeg monitoring and some studies they say that it is gold standard for diagnosis of epilepsy on eeg in cases of dementia this is some data where uh, they said that long term video eeg would give you know uh, abnormal changes in more than 50% of the cases of epilepsy now 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 there are some unique challenges which uh, you know uh, this particular population it poses to us i'm sure in your clinical settings you have seen uh, old patients with or without dementia with injuries which are more severe than you know for a different age group as i said they have a prolonged period of post cyclical confusion and there is significant impact on the quality of life employment i am not sure it's very important they can't drive i am not sure in our uh, country many old people they do drive and the the most important is the competency competency for living independently and there are more intolerant tolerant issues when it comes to medication a unique example i can show you in this particular slide now we all know that phenytoin follows a non linear pharmacokinetics now if you see in this slide the peak toxic effect of phenytoin in elderly is much much before the usual dose at is seen in other cases suppose supposedly in children so in a lesser amount of dose of phenytoin or plasma level there is higher chances of people they developing side effects now when you talk about treatment of epilepsy in elderly population or for that matter dementia population uh, we should choose a drug which has got least drug drug interaction because these people are on many drugs as a you know all together most commonly reported side effects by this particular population is imbalance mood swings sedation sleep problems you know weight changes and as I, as i said there are coexisting medical problems accordingly dose has to be modified then compliance is a major issue and it should be looked into in each and every cases and we should always look for management of precipitating factor for this particular situation be it sleep related problems condition affecting the quality of sleep management of stress any chronic infection or hormonal or electrolyte imbalance now this particular slide uh, gives you a sneak peek into how to approach an older person who presents to you with seizures now uh, i'm i'm going to the bottom first when a person has an existing diagnosis of epilepsy we should review the diagnosis these days with the advent of smartphones uh, we should always you know uh, ask people to, to make a video if it is possible so that which which helps us understand the semiology of seizure in a better way if appropriate we have to re repeat an imaging mri if available and eeg as i and i as i said that longer eeg re recording uh, is always better we should do a medical management and if it is drug resistant we should either you know go for further you know like secondary care or we should assess for epilepsy surgery which is not very commonly done in this particular age group now for a new onset seizure i'm sure we all understand how an emergency situation you know presents so i'll not go into the details of this we all know how to go about it if it's a non acute presentation which is most commonly being the case the first thing is to establish diagnosis 
by reviewing of description by the caregiver or videos if they are available you should try to run a battery of tests including blood investigations ecg eeg and mri and we should start anti seizure medication when appropriate the idea and i i repeat whenever we start anti seizure medication the idea is that the person should be seizure free that is the most com it's not there is not like that it should reduce to this much this is reduced to this percent the person has to become seizure free now seeing the dosage or the posology of anti epileptic drugs in elderly uh, this is you know uh, the data which is available for these drugs uh, for example carbamazepine is basically given it, it should start at the dose of 100 to 200 mg in divided doses the target dose is lesser than uh, you know uh, the usual population uh, many studies they say 400 uh, one study said 600 mg valproate again should be started in divided doses and uh, we should increase by 300 mg target doses 800 to 1000 mg and then lamotrigine lamotrigine is a very interesting drug when it comes to uh, you know dementia with uh, and epilepsy it should uh, as we all know that uh, like valproid fights with all other medication when it comes to plasma uh, protein binding so uh, accordingly we have to adjust the dose the target dose of lamotrigine ranges anywhere from 100 to 150 mg per day oxcarbazepine is a very notorious drug when it comes to be given in elderly because we all know that it very commonly is associated with hyponatremia so you have to you know weigh the risk benefit ratio of starting oxcarbazepine levetiracetam again it's a relatively safe drug though much of safety data is actually not available for its use uh, in epilepsy in elderly or dementia population now interestingly there is one more aspect of you know uh, which is associated with epilepsy is cognitive impairment there are studies which have consistently shown that chronic epilepsy is associated with static or progressive cognitive and behavioral disturbances in young population uh, epileptic encephalopathies like progressive myoclonic epilepsies or i say uh, you know in very young population like lennox gastaut syndrome they present with severe cognitive deterioration uh, with anti epileptic treatment although we are you know achieving a seizure control but many of the anti epileptics particularly the older anti epileptics are associated with decrease in the cognitive functions uh, notably uh, barbiturates and benzodiazepine carbamazepine phenytoin and valproate they have modest effect on cognition and we should always yearn for a optimal clinical management of anti epileptics as which holds true for each and every case of epilepsy we should start slow you know gradually increase the dose and let us allow the cognitive side effects to have a set sort of habituation this is actually it works we have used in many pop, uh, cases over the years and it does work i can tell you with my clinical experience so this is just a chart of you know various medications you can see uh, the cognitive side effects are most commonly as i said seen with benzodiazepines and phenobarbiton but i must tell you i'm seeing a lot of cases of focal onset seizures taking carbamazepine for years together and they come to us and tell that doctor sahab Uh, आजकल कुछ याद नहीं रहता है हम भूल जाते हैं आई एम नॉट सींग दैट दे आर डेवलपिंग डिमेंशिया बट डेफिनेटली ऑल दीज ड्रग्स दे डू हैव अ बैग फुल ऑफ कॉग्नेटिव डिसफंक्शन ऑन लॉन्ग टर्म यूज दो वी हैव टू ऑलवेज यू नो चेक फॉर द रिस्क बेनिफिट रेशियो ऑफ आइदर डिक्रीजिंग द डोज और चेंजिंग द एंटी एपिलेप्टिक so to conclude my presentation uh, and i must tell you it's very very important here to look into this epilepsy in elderly is not rare or epilepsy in dementia is not rare it is uh, it has got high incidence actually i missed the slide where i wanted to show you the uh, you know incidence of epilepsy and it says the literature says that the prevalence population prevalence of epilepsy is 10 per 1000 in elderly 
it is three times. It is thirty-eight point two per one thousand population. So it is high incident. There is high incident, but it is underdiagnosed. Brain tumors, as an etiology, are overrated. At the same time, cerebral cerebral vascular accident etiology is underrated. It is relatively easier to control, and newer drugs like the valproate is not a new drug, but drugs like valproate and lamotrigine they are better than the traditional drugs which we have been commonly using like phenobarbital, benzodiazepine, or barbiturate. There is still limited knowledge of the association of epilepsy and dementia, particularly in the development of dementia in epilepsy. I have been talking about. Uh, you know uh, epilepsy and dementia but there is very little knowledge very little understanding of development of dementia in epilepsy with this i would like to uh, end my presentation with a thank you note uh, to the organizers and my chairpersons with a brief glimpse of uh, the institute where i work uh, thank you all for your patient listening uh, i am stopping my uh, screen share and i'm happy to answer if there are any questions thank you very much for your patient listening over to you Ah, thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Nishant Goel. Uh, an excellent presentation, a very comprehensive eye opener for, I think, most of us. Uh, especially your uh, primary focus on the fact that epilepsy is underdiagnosed, even amongst epilepsy, the cause of the cerebrovascular accident is underdiagnosed. And we tend to overdiagnose or look overtly more for brain tumors, assuming those tumors to be as you showed in your bar diagram. Sure. That before 65, they form 50% of the cause of uh, epilepsy, but after 65, they form a very less percentage. So yeah, rightly so. And also, I liked your insight about the use of lamotrigine. Because, and uh, I think in, in the last maybe eight or 10 years, for the first time, I've heard somebody talk about zonisamide. Uh, I was one of the uh, pre-launch, pre-regulatory trial uh, investigators for zonisamide in complex partial seizures in India and abroad. And it is, I think I'm one of the rare people who uses it a lot in, in Bombay and uh, Maharashtra. But nice to see that you have rated it as uh, quite high amongst your list of use in the elderly. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would open it to uh, Dr. Mahesh. Could you uh, lead? Dr. Mahesh? What am Dr. Mahesh is... Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. There are around three questions from the chat box that I can pick up, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ganguly wants to know what is topathies. Can you please explain it again is what he's asked. Sure. So uh, basically topathy is a new term, relatively new term, which is given to a combination of different type of dementias where presence of tau protein is supposed to okay. be or um, you know uh, to understood to be the main pathology behind it. I've already like uh, mentioned about there are four types of dementias. One is a frontotemporal dementia. Uh, second is the uh, uh, corticobasal degeneration, PSP, and there's one more type of dementia. So these dementias are basically uh, termed under tauopathies. Now, interesting part of tauopathy when it comes to epilepsy and dementia is that tau protein uh, or presence of tau protein is most commonly correlated with GABAergic hyperactivity in cases of epilepsy and dementia. So that is why understanding of topathy is very, very important. So yeah, this is what uh, it is over. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Nishan, there's also one other important question uh, in terms of management of status in elderly. Yeah. Yeah. See, again, it's uh, I, di I didn't take up this particular matter because we all know and we all see what is how a status epilepticus is managed. It is not different from management of status epilepticus in a yeah. young child or uh, an ad adolescent or an adult. 
the same thing has to be done in elderly population the only rider in elderly population is because they have multiple medical comorbidities so we need to have you know knowledge of what medication they are on and what physical problem they are suffering from otherwise the same drill you know uh, and an icu treatment and like uh, phosphenetoin or phenytoin so all these things so i not i didn't go in like knowingly with the details of this so dr mahesh there's yeah one last thing i think somebody wants to uh, ask about brivaracetam as compared Correct, to yes. yeah yeah so again uh, as we all know that brivaracetam is a relatively new molecule and uh, there is very less and i i must say there is no uh, head to head trial or there are no field studies of use of brivaracetam in cases uh, in elderly cases of uh, epilepsy but uh, as it has been uh, approved Uh, in india for use of any age group after the age of 16 years so i presume that brevaracetam can be used but again we don't have data brevaracetam versus levetiracetam so i'll you know keep my uh, you know comments options uh, yes sir, yeah so i can't tell because we don't have literature about that thank you thank you Uh, some reports that you know the behavioral uh, symptoms or the worsening that happens of psychological problems yeah when you use the newer molecule is better compared to the yes 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 problems. actually this is there uh, then people are people have also talked about switching from levetiracetam to brevaracetam right. when a person is having you know behavioral activation right. or psychosis for that matter but again as i said that uh that is more seen in uh, you know adult population or adolescent population rather than you know that uh, old age population elderly population or dementia for that matter so that is what it is we do have literature but not in this particular age group right okay uh i think we have reached the end of uh, allotted time sir. uh very indebted sir to you uh, yes, sir. for this brilliant and very elaborate very comprehensive presentation sir it Thank is you. really an eye opener uh, and uh, i believe that any conference that i go to or any meeting i go to from where i go back with two three take home messages is worth my time and i believe you have made my time much more today sir thank, thank you, you very sir. much thank you so much sir. thank you so much for having me sir thank you thank you uh dr mahesh can we see? have dr dr nilesh's introduction is i am I think a uh, joke in Bombay, but yes, let's go ahead. So I thought uh, you will be introducing is what Dr. Avinash said, sir. He said uh, Dr. Uh, okay, uh, dear friend, and he would not want to lose his opportunity. <laughs> okay, Dr. Nilesha, yes, is is one of the most uh, proficient and more accomplished teacher, uh, more uh, most liked teacher also in the city of Bombay. uh my only sad uh, misgivings were that he was never my teacher i was not young enough to be his student uh but he was my he was my supervisor for my md exam and uh uh he has he taught and coached many a students and i admire his uh, tenacity and his uh, uh, ability to uh, teach them with love and kindness and also to encourage them to publish to write and present and i think more papers come out of this department than any other department uh in not only in bombay but in the country uh and that is with his gentle coaxing and his convincing and i'm i'm very very happy to uh have his contribution to us and he's a very good teacher and i really like his style of teaching he's very humorous and i i believe you are going to have a good taste of that today so uh dr nilesh over to you please thank you very much uh, dr mittal dr gouda i am very happy to be over here and i am grateful to all of you for inviting me and uh, asking me to make a presentation on this uh, very interesting topic uh, testamental capacity and dementia it's a short presentation we already had uh, two presentations and i'll now present on testamental capacity and dementia uh one of the 
very important thing uh, which uh, many people have told me that certification is not a mandatory requirement for making a will. So even if you don't have a certificate stating that you are fit to make a will, still you can make a will. And if it is not contested, uh, there is no problem. Vice versa, even if you have certificate stating that uh, you are fit to make a will, there is a possibility that your will will be contested and people will say that uh, this certificate which was given to you was false and uh, there will be court cases and uh, you will have to go to the court and justify that you have given the certificate and at that time the person was in proper frame of mind, sound state of mind to make a will. The question which is asked by many of us is, can a person having dementia make a will? So uh, I have uh, experience of two cases uh, where uh, the patient had dementia and let's see what we did. Uh, Saraswati Bai, a 78 year old grandmother, she was a diagnosed case of Alzheimer's dementia and her MMS score at the time when she was referred to us was 18, 18 out of 30. She was already started on a combination of tablet donepezil and memantil, which is a usual practice in many of the hospitals. She was referred from our neurology department where actually she was following up. They had uh, investigated her and finally come to conclusion that she has Alzheimer's dementia. And then she was referred from neurology department for the assessment of testamental capacity. And she was brought to our department by her grandson. Now the question uh, in front of us that she is already 78 years old. She has been seen in medical department, subsequently in neurology department, all the investigations have run. Diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia has been more or less confirmed from the clinical history, mental status examination, MMSC score and MRI scan which they had done and whether now, whether she is fit to make a will. Now, some of us felt that because she has a dementia, she is not fit to make a will and residents usually take the cases and then present it to seniors. And we were in a dilemma whether to give her the certificate as saying that she is suffering from dementia and not fit to make a will or we uh, find out whether she can make a will or not. So uh, we started talking to her uh, and we requested her uh, grandson to wait outside the OPD and uh, she was sitting in my room and I was there, one of the resident doctors was there and we asked her that uh, why ha has she come to our hospital? Uh, in uh, Mumbai, uh, most of the people are Marathi speaking and we were talking to her Marathi so we said, Namaskar Aji Bhai, uh, uh, hospital madhe yai sa karan kai zala. Manje, ha, why have you come to a hospital? And she said that uh, there was only one reason that uh, her uh, doctor and the lawyer, the vakil ne sangitla, the lawyers told her that go to a doctor and get a certificate that you can make a will. So that's why she had come to the hospital. Now she knew that she had come to the hospital because she wanted a certificate stating that she is fit to make a will. So we were very surprised that even in spite of having dementia, she knew why she had come to the hospital. Then the next question we asked that uh, is she doing it voluntarily? And she said yes. Uh, she was doing this uh, process voluntarily and the third thing which we asked her that what does she want to do what does she want to write in her will and she said very clearly that she had a room at Bandra that was the only one small room which was on her name uh, they did not have any children uh, she had uh, uh, two brothers and one sister and one of the brother's son was staying with her and this was the grandson with whom she had come to the hospital. 
she said 15 years back her husband passed away and after that this room was transferred in her name she has been staying in that room since very very long time even immediately after the marriage she was staying there and now for all these years she has been staying over there and for last 15 years after her husband this grandson has been staying with her and looking after her he goes to work he earns money and he looks after the household things and looks after the grandmother and she said uh, she has come only for one thing and that one thing is that she wanted to write that after her death this room should go to her grandson she knew because she had another two brothers and a sister and after death her husband's family members were also there and they also might put a claim on this room so she was very very clear though her mental status examination she did not know the time she did not know the place she uh, she, she did not know the month uh, month year etc what we do in mental status examination but she knew this very very clearly and she said it okay she wants to give this room to her grandson after her death and that's what she wanted to write in the will so in spite of having uh, dementia of uh, moderate severity uh, we gave a certificate and we wrote very clearly in that that patient has been evaluated mrs so and so uh, came to our hospital on such and such date at such and such time she was a diagnosed case of dementia we had interviewed her and examined her, examined her for her capacity to make a will on such and such day in our OPD 21 at such and such time. On examination, we found that she was suffering from she was suffering from dementia. But in spite of having dementia, she clearly knew that she had one room. That is, she knew about the extent of her property. She knew about all the heads, so she knew that there are relatives on her husband's side, there are relatives on her side, and who all are there. And logically, because uh, this logic made sense that the grandson, who was a grand uh, uh, grandson, means actually uh, Natu, they call it the brother's son, uh, had come and. Uh, um, uh, she wanted to give that uh, property to her. So in spite of having dementia, we gave her a certificate stating that she is fit to make a will. The second case where it was in the court and in the court, usually many of us are invited as an expert witness. And many times they say that doctor, please answer in one word. Uh, if you remember in school, we used to get uh, in our exam paper answer in one word. So many times as lawyers, when you are in the court, they, you, they tell you that doctor, please answer in one word, either say yes or no. Uh, we don't want to uh, listen to your elaborate uh, things. So in one such case, when we were invited, uh, I was there in the court and he asked me, uh, doctor, have you used tablet donepezin? And obviously, um, any of us, uh, when we are sending in court, we have to say the truth. And we have used donepezin for a large number of patients suffering from dementia. So I said, yes. Second question which was asked is, is it used for the treatment of dementia? Obviously, again, second question that, yes, I have used it for dementia. So yes. The answer was brief and one word. The third question the lawyer asked, Dr. Mr. Sequera, an 84-year-old male, was prescribed Donepezil. So is it likely that he was suffering from dementia? And answer to that question was also yes. Because yes, if somebody is suffering from dementia or somebody if is prescribed uh, Donepezil, probably he was suffering from dementia. Is he likely 
Uh, so is it likely that he was suffering from dementia? And he, I said, yes. And the final question which he asked, which was a trick question. Do individuals having dementia have a memory problem, have memory problems? And as a result, they are unable to make a will. Now here, I understood that his purpose was that already Mr. Sequera had prepared a will about four years back, five years back. After his death, the, uh, the will was opened and some of the relatives who did not get any their name in that will, they went to the court with this lawyer and they said that he was suffering from dementia and that's why whatever will he has prepared is not a valid one. And so it should not be according to the will. Uh, it should be equally distributed amongst all the relatives. Luckily for them, they found a paper, the medical record of uh, Mr. Sequera, which mentioned tablet donepezil. And so on the basis of that, he wanted to prove that the patient was taking donepezil. That means he was suffering from dementia. He was diagnosed as a dementia. And that's why his will is not a valid will and that should be not considered. Now, this is a trick question and one has to be very careful while answering the trick question. Here, actually, he has asked me two questions. Do individuals having dementia have memory problems? The answer to that is yes. Uh, mainly, uh, it's a memory disturbances. We call it Smruti Pang. And as a result, are they unable to make a will? And the answer to that question is no. That even if the person has dementia, it does not mean that just because he has dementia, he is not fit to make a will. Even patients with dementia, if they can understand, then they are fit to make a will. So I was very careful in answering the question. I did not say either yes or no. I said, answer to your first question is yes. And answer to your second question is no. Though he had put two questions together, I separated two and I said, answer to your first question is yes. And answer to your second question is no. And he said, what do you mean by that? I said, answer to your first question that do individuals having dementia have memory problems? I said, yes, they have memory problems. And second, as a result, they are unable to make a will? No. They are able to make a will even if they have memory problems. And then obviously I explained in detail that how many of the patients, just because they have dementia, it does not mean that they are unfit to make a will. And at that time, some family physician had kind of signed on the will. And if I said family physician has examined the patient and given the fitness, that should be considered more valid rather than just a prescription of donepezil because of which you are making that will invalid. So in conclusion, the two messages uh, which I wish to give is having dementia per se does not render a person unfit to make a will. That is my first uh, thing. And the second, in spite of having de dementia, if a person can clearly state his wish, his or her wish, then he or she can make a will. Very clear. So, where there is a will, there are many relatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As usual, uh, very succinct, very brief, very to the point, and uh, very clear. Uh, true. Uh, what is testamentary capacity is what I would like to ask uh, Dr. Nilesh Shah to give us the five points you need to evaluate when you establish testamentary capacity. Uh, he's an expert on that. Dr. Nilesh, if you could please remind okay. us. Yeah, it's very, very simple. First, the person should know that he's making a will. Yes. So you simply ask the person that what brings you to the hospital and the person's answer should be that he wants to make a will and that's why he needs a certificate that he is fit to make a will. Yeah. Once he says, we ask him that is there any pressure or force or influence on you 
or you are making this will voluntarily and he says yes i am doing this voluntarily without any pressure or without any external influence it is fully with my free will that i am making this will fine number 3 do you know the extent of your property uh, once in a while it so happens that person says that i want to give so and so to so and so the property which is not fully in his name and we have faced this kind of situation that the house is on two names husband and wife and husband says that i want to give this house to so and so but we say it's in two names so only half of that you can write in your will you can't write full house so he should know the extent of his property which may include a, a house or zameen cash shares jewelry etc etc so briefly he says that yes these are the extent of your property number 4 is do you know all the legal heirs who all are the legal heirs and they should know that they have so many children if the children are not there then who will be the legal heirs etc and finally most important most most important is is that the reason for which they are doing a distribution say for example if they say i want to give my property equally to all my uh, children i have two children or three children and i want to uh, distribute equally it's a fine that is it's logical if they say uh, my daughter is already married and at the time of marriage we have given her so much things so i want to give this property to my son logical fine if the person says that i have three sons two sons have gone abroad they are uh, staying over there and they are well to do they are very well settled this third son is not doing so well he is staying with us he doesn't have his own house other two sons already have his own house that's why i want to give all this house to my son and not to other two sons logical absolutely fine here the logic is pure clear if the person says i don't want to give because that person is doing jadu on or on me or that person so if there is a delusion or if it doesn't make you uh, understand that why he is doing it so the reason uh, we usually find out that why why he wants to distribute his property in certain way and if that makes a sense then we give fitness that he is fit to make it so these five points uh, i would say uh, are important for uh, making a will right this is exactly what uh, i think uh, uh, is necessary for us to remember because uh, sir's first case actually represents the five points that the lady had the capacity to give the five points that sir said just now and if she has that she had testamentary capacity so it didn't matter whether she had alzheimer's or not the fact was that she could answer those five questions and uh, that is what testamentary capacity is. so thank you very much sir thank you very much again and uh, dr mahesh if you'd like to comment anything uh, yes sir i was actually wondering on one important thing sir uh, in the second scenario that you talked about where the sons were abroad and uh, there's one son who's not so doing well staying with the the, the person who's making the will uh could it also not be that you know he is making undue influence on this person because he has the proximity and uh, he is trying to uh, get his things done or manipulation in some way and the other sons being away and uh, doing well should not be a justification right sir because uh, he is just staying with him and taking care we don't know whether the elderly parents are taking care of the son or son is taking care of them um so many scenarios it's the elderly person till the end actually providing food shelter accommodation uh, to a son who is not so doing well how do we remove this sort of undue influence on uh, making a will sir yeah so one of the thing is that whenever you interview now if say for example father and mother both are there then you request the son to wait outside and then individually interview father individually interview mother and try to find out that what makes sense if they say that he uh, and we take them into confidence and say okay, yes i understand that uh, this son is staying with you other two sons are staying abroad and is he trying to kind of uh, force you 
or is he threatening you? And you can tell me in confidence, I will not share it with your son or your spouse, but I'll make you uh, unfit or I will not give fitness certificate or I'll find out some way to overcome this. So I think uh, it is a very delicate issue and here the psychiatrist skill of judging whether what they say is uh, is a logical, unbiased. believable, unbiased or there appears to be some influence and this is absolutely subjective thing. Now whether we go into this or whether we don't go into it, uh, I think uh, we should go into it because it's a very important thing. But some psychiatrists feel that that is not our business. We only uh, say that uh, whatever they want to do, they can do. And if it's illogical still, if they know the extent of their property and if they know the legal has, whatever they are doing, that's fine. We don't go into this logical reasoning for distribution of property. So I must also uh, add uh, my experience here, uh, probably because of my inexperience, I've actually got into trouble in one of the scenarios. Here, yes. there's a gentleman who had come to distribute his property among the son and a daughter. It was extremely unequal and the daughter was getting 8% or 10% of the share compared to the two sons who were getting 90% of the share. I actually had come to transference. I was trying to be an advocate for the daughter here. And I said that as a dad, you have to do social justice. These are the legal hairs. So why are you making it unequal? So I've actually got into this area. He did not come back to me. <laughs> yeah. So see, uh, uh, whatever our ideas may be, that it should be equal distribution or uh, daughter also should equal. I think we should not uh, put it on the people. Each of them have their own ideas. And uh, if in their uh, religion or in their community, if this is a practice that uh, they uh, already give something to the daughter at the time of uh, marriage, earlier it was called Kariyavar or uh, Dowry or something like that. And now the uh, girl uh, has gone, she is married, she is well settled, she is doing extremely well. And then there are two sons who are going to look after me. That's the kind of uh, logical reasoning. And from their perspective, their community perspective, if you feel that this logical reasoning is fine and there are no delusions or there are no ideas of preference, etc., then I think uh, we should go ahead and give them the fitness certificate. But uh, it's a very good example of how we should not try to influence uh, their decision directly yeah. or indirectly. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I have experienced... Uh, after the will has been made, much later, uh, somebody known to them has come and told me that the reason the distribution was done was there were some underlying disputes which were going on. And that is why they had done this unequal distribution. So that becomes very important that we do not get into it because they may not tell us why they want to do this unequal distribution. We have to respect their wishes. right? We can ask them, what if they are they aware that they are doing an unequal distribution? distribution and leave it at that. We should not be judgmental. So thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, on the chat? Yes, okay. yes, sir. There's one question in the chat by Dr. Pramod. Uh, he wants to know, uh, would you need any kind of affidavit before certifying for dementia? Is any rider about natural death to be mentioned in the will? Uh, I did not really get the question. Uh, uh, efforts he he wants to know whether it, uh, is there any format for an affidavit to be given when they're making uh, uh, a will and also to say that is there any rider to talk about natural death to be mentioned in the will so uh, who, who has to make the affidavit me the patient i i think uh, doctor uh, wanted to know whether the patient should give an affidavit on, on this counts for you to give a certificate no 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 why, why patient should give an affidavit? What affidavit patient would give? Okay. Uh, to say that he is saying everything as a truth and things like we want any sort of... No, uh, no, no. no, no, no. Okay. Uh, I understand this. Uh, uh, usually, at, according to our practice, which we uh, do it, uh, we do not ask for any affidavit. Only in a case which is likely to be contested, where uh, it's not an equal distribution or you feel or the parents feel that this person will go to court or that person is likely to go to court. Uh, some of them ask for video recording. So we call a professional video recorder 
and that person uh, records the full thing he also gives a certificate stating that he has recorded this on such and such day and on a cd drive uh, uh, a dvd drive and a pen drive it is given to the person who has made the will and he keeps it with him and he has a option of give it give, give that a recording and uh, that uh, drive to someone whom he wants to kind of Fact. give it or uh, whom he has given the property so again whom the case is likely to be or the executor of the will executor yes. of the will yeah right okay so thank you thank you very much sir we have uh, one to... la one last thing uh, what uh, he mentioned is the logic uh, behind whether we should uh, go into that logic or not and i think there is a little confusion but what we do is when we write down on the paper that he says that this is the extent of your property these are his legal heirs we also mention the logic behind the distribution so tomorrow if somebody daughter goes to the court saying that i got only 90% and they uh, i got only 10% and my brothers got 90% whatever the logic or whatever the reasoning was there that also we mention for the judge to understand that why it was an equal distribution and at that time if the judge finds it that yes this is a reasonable reason according to the community yeah. traditions then he might uphold the will what was in the patient's mind mind at that time at that time yeah. so i think thank you very much sir again uh, thank you all the speakers all the uh, people who have attended on this day uh, and stayed on yes. till for this whole one and a half hours uh, thank you the organizers dr vinash uh, dr priyanka uh, thank you to my co-chair dr mahesh gowda uh, very much for being there for this extremely insightful program thoda hatke not the usual topics of dementia but everything related to old age and dementia which is a burning topic like i said earlier uh, you know 30 to 40% of our practices are in the next 10 years going to be geriatric patients with dementia or old age problems so we have to look at that kind of uh, clientele in the future so thank you very much to all the speakers for having taken so much trouble to prepare slides and come and present to us uh, dr gowda if you would like to sum up yeah, i think you did it all sir thank you for the opportunity it was wonderful listening to all the three offbeat topics very much relevant to critical issues in management in clinical practice sir. thank you so much for a wonderful program thank you uh priyanka you or my uh, avinash would like to take over um i don't know if avinash is around or not but thank you so much everyone for being here on a big day uh, uh, as so started it's been a hectic day with webinars but we end with the best of all uh, thank you all for being here uh, have a lovely evening or night and uh, we'll see you tomorrow for the regular wednesday program which is again on dementia uh, starting at uh, 7:30 uh, i will send the details um, via whatsapp group and uh, also you'll find the recording of this program on the youtube channel thank you so much everyone have a good night good thank night. you good night good night, good night.